Continuing our series of video tours, M103 is described, perhaps a little bit optimistically, in the manual as a heavily armored, full-tracked combat vehicle of low silhouette. Into this low silhouette would fit five personnel, including notably two loaders. Now, the M103 did not have the greatest service career in the U.S. Army, but the Marine Corps took it for much longer. One of those trainee Marines was, at the time, Second Lieutenant Ken Estes, who grew over the years to become a historian and author, Kenneth Estes, and he's here with me today to just go over the vehicle that is here at the Military Vehicle Technology Foundation in Portola Valley, California. So Ken, why is it that the Marines kept the M103 program going while the Army abandoned it? Well, as we know, the Army had several heavy tank projects going on at the end of World War II, uh, but that they lost both money and interest in, in these projects, and they petered out. Uh, the Marine Corps, though, maintained its requirement for a heavy tank after the war. Basically, it's because of our doctrine for the amphibious landing, where we originally wanted light tanks of the Marine Division to land in the assault force, then be followed up and reinforced by medium tanks from the higher headquarters, the core level tank battalion then would uh, continue the action inland. But when the Marine Corps went to all medium tanks in World War II, uh, that, f that extra uh, reinforcing tank battalion by default became a heavy tank battalion. And so that's what our doctrine and our requirements call for in the, 19, in the late 1940s. Um, we always wanted a heavy tank, and then when we were written into war plans by 1948, which put Marine divisions up against potentially Soviet Army uh, forces in the Persian Gulf, the West, Western Europe and Southern Europe, became more of an imperative than for the Corps to have its heavy tank. We had bought some M26s in the meantime, but these were carried only as interim uh, or substitute heavy tanks. It was not the heavy tank we wanted for the job. Now we jumped to the Korean War then, and we have the tank crisis of 1950, when all of us have nothing but World War II gear, and the Army prototypes for the next generation, M41, 42, I'm sorry, T41, T42, T43, the light, medium, and heavy tanks are just on the drawing boards, and these are rushed into production. The M103 prototype was nothing more than a wooden mock-up at the time, but these tanks were produced all between 1950 and 1953 and entered service as the M103. Okay, so you're trained primarily in the M48. You come down to the motor pool for your M103 training. You look at this thing. What goes through your mind? Oh, what a heavy bugger. And how slow it must be because being brand new tankers, we just wanted to go fast and furious and everything and we thought this thing would be a drag. Okay, well, let's go have a look around all the components and see what makes it work. Suspension on this tank consists of 14 pairs of road wheels mounted to arms on torsion bar suspension. Each road wheel arm has a bump stop to prevent it from going up too high, and there are friction snubbers on the number 1, 2, 3, 6, and 7 arms to prevent rocking. Adjusting the track tension on this tank appears to have been a particularly convoluted process. You had to coast to a stop without the use of brakes in such a manner that the track link would stop directly on top of the return rotors. So to go over the process, I'm going to bring Ken back in. So Ken, what does it have to do? Okay, let's first look at the compensating idler arm in there. You notice it's a six-sided uh, barrel, which actually rotates around a threaded uh, inner arm. And that extends and retracts the idler arm and, create, and sets the actual tension. So we'll first take a few turns off that to make the track looser. Then we'll grab a tank bar and with a couple guys, get in, get in and lift literally lift the track up so we can put a one inch wooden block, uh, one inch thick wooden block on number two uh, return roller. That done, we'll put a string tightly between the tops of those two uh, return rollers and then we will 
tighten or loosen the track as necessary to get a 1 8 inch to 3 16 inch difference between or gap between the bottom of the track and that string. That's the correct setting. And then we, res we just uh, bend up and grab that uh, piece of wood again or sacrifice it later on when we drive off. That's how you get the track tension correctly set. Uh, whilst talking about the idler arm, you'll note that it is physically connected to the number one road wheel arm. As a result, when the road wheel goes up, the idler is pushed forward and down, and this maintains track tension on the entire track. All right, so we're at the front of the tank. A couple of things here. Firstly, this will be where the handles go for the first and second shots of the fire extinguisher. Then we have the headlight assembly. We have the service drive, blackout service, blackout marker, and there will be a small shrouded light here called the blackout drive. So Ken, when is it that you would use the one versus the other versus the third? The service drive would be used administratively at night when there's no presence of the enemy or any tactical problem. It's a standard headlight just like the same one used on trucks. In fact, we have the same uh, high, high beam, low beam switch on, the, on for your left foot to use just like in trucks. The identical light is here but with a red lens for use, for use in driving under infrared conditions. If we come over here to the hatch of the driver, we see a position for a periscope there. That is the uh, mount for the driver's infrared uh, scope, which actually has uh, two eyepieces and allows you to drive in infrared. Uh, the distance, though, useful distance is only about 15 to 20 feet, so you don't go very fast. And it's a very weird uh, situation. You don't get a good sense of uh, depth, uh, depth perception. of perception or anything like that. Then there's so-called blackout driving, which means you have a very small uh, hooded uh, light here illuminating, again, about 10 or 15 feet of the ground in front of you. And uh, this is also done very slowly and very carefully. The blackout marker is for other people to see you. Uh, these glow at very, very low levels so that uh, uh, you can keep track of other vehicles in the column. Or if you want to position this uh, tank at night using a ground guide, the ground guide can see the tank by looking at the markers on either side and then use a red lens flashlight to signal the driver to move forward, right, left, stop. Right. And so the, the ground guide is basically a guy with a flashlight marshalling people which way to go. Right. And those markers then would allow you to do that without illuminating any other part of the action. Okay, so here we are under the business end of the 120 rifle. You got the bore evacuator and a strange little item at the end with two notches on it. What is that for? <laughs> Originally it was much larger uh, because we had two large holes about like that in the uh, and, and on either side. The idea being to have a blast effect deflector that would vent some of the the, the, f the smoke of the uh, muzzle end to one side and not obscure our sights very much. But it didn't work, so we cut it way back and left those two notches there simply as kind of a spanner tool uh, edge to tighten it down. It, sir, it's only purpose is to uh, torque down on the bore evacuator uh, so that uh, it won't come loose during shock or firing. All right. so while we're here talking about the gun, this is not the same 120 that was originally in the Army's T-34, is it? Well, that's true. Uh, the original idea of the, Ar the Army had, at the suggestion of Army Ground Forces, was to abandon some of the wilder heavy tank schemes they had and to take the well-proven and well-known 120 millimeter anti-aircraft gun and put that into a, a smaller, more maneuverable tank. And that became the concept. Uh, so the T-34 tried that out. But when we went to the 103 project, we uh, made a much more powerful gun, greater chamber pressure, and a little bit longer in the tube. And this was actually the T-123 cannon, uh, much improved in ballistics and, uh, of course, ammunition variety in this tank than you had in the original T-34 prototype. And you had shot, heat, HE, anything and, else? And white phosphorus. Smoke. Mm -hmm. Okay, as you move along the Sponson side, behind the main stowage box, what we have here is an ELF air filter housing. There is one housing on each side of the engine. Pull it open. The 
pull it up, release the locking lever, and give a good solid pull. The filter itself, as you can see, it's made of cloth, and what you can do is you can uh, get compressed air, shake it out, blow it, and otherwise clean out the air filter. Return it back into position exactly the converse of the way you took it out. Lock it into place. Close the compartment and bolt it back into place. On the rear left of the tank, we have the external telephone, sometimes also known as the tank infantry phone. What will happen is a rifleman who needs support will come up, approach the left rear of the tank, drop down the hatch, pull out your handle, push the talk. Invariably, this was a signal for the driver to put the tank into reverse and scare the hell out of the rifleman. Also to note, he could transmit off the radio by the use of a push button. The little red light on the top here was basically the tank driver's way of telling a rifleman to come and answer the phone. He had a button in the crew compartment, the, the little red light would light up red, and this would be the signal for the rifleman to approach the tank. All right, Ken, so what is it that we're looking at here? Well, we have here the AVD 1790 cubic inch and in diesel engine. The intake air is coming from uh, the inlet we'll see in the turret. You'll show that. So if outside air is coming through this tube into the air cleaner that you demonstrated. The clean air is being, is being sucked then by that turbine, which is you see the outer part of the turbine, the turbo uh, intake, which is exhaust driven, and goes that pressure then into the intake manifold of the engine. That's the air supply. The fuel supply we can't see, it's at the front of the engine uh, with its own set of uh, uh, double air, uh, double fuel filters. Notice here the quick disconnects for the electrical connections. This engine can be uh, taken out of the tank in about 30 minutes with a crane, a small crane. We check the oil level here. We do the oil uh, 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 filling in that connection there. On the upside of the engine, you have the same setup for the, the transmission oil. You can also see the top here of one of the three uh, fuel cells. These are aluminum. They conform to the shape of the tank. This allowed us to carry a total of 385 gallons in this tank as opposed to a much smaller amount of gasoline in its predecessor. This little gizmo here is for a purge pump so that you can uh, actually uh, manually pump some uh, fuel out from the bottom. You tend, where you tend to gather uh, cor uh, corruption of various sorts in the in the fuel settles to the bottom, you, uh, including water, which is a nasty, nasty thing to have also. So you periodically purge the fuel cells manually with a little uh, pump of the uh, impurities and, and garbage that sometimes arrives in your fuel, despite the fuel filters. Of course, this is the diesel-powered version of the engine. Why is it that the Marines moved from the pre previous petrol to the new diesel. Well, the Marine Corps had its choice. We could go with the Army's new M60, which was a diesel uh, medium tank or main battle tank, but we wanted to keep our fleet, which we'd bought with uh, hard cash some years before. So we took the chief M60 improvement, which was the diesel engine, and backfitted onto this tank and in the M48 medium. In the case of this tank, its operational range went from about 80 miles in gasoline to uh, approximately 300 miles on diesel. And 80 miles on gasoline, as we tankers know, means you go 40 miles operationally, then you spend the rest of your time trying to find fuel trucks to uh, top you back off again. So it really changed the nature of, uh, of the tank force that now had, uh, had legs, so to speak, had a real operational range that was useful. Very important for us at the time. So what is it the Marines had to assist with the recovery of a vehicle of this size. Uh, we fixed that in the Marine Corps because the only recover vehicle we took uh, after we got rid of the M4 series, the so-called Shermans, was the M51 heavy tank retriever, a uh, 
a tank retriever built on this chassis, the heavy tank chassis, with an even more powerful uh, gasoline engine, which developed a thousand horsepower as opposed to the 750 horsepower. It was quite a beast, and it was just as heavy as the heavy tank, but it had a 50 ton winch and a 25 ton uh, crane. And it was pretty much equal to the job of recovering even this, this bear when it got buried or bogged down. So at the left rear of the engine compartment, what we have here is the transmission oil. Get a stick and fill it. Which appears to be pretty well equipped. And what we also can just see here is one of the steering linkages, which uh, as the driver turns the steering wheel, it applies or reduces power to the transmission. Okay, well that covers it for the engine deck. We'll uh, close it up and move on. Uh, welcome back to our video tour of the M103. We're now moving into the turret and the crew compartment. So Ken, you were the officer. You got to ride in a position of power in the TC's hatch. So uh, when you relive your old memories, hop inside and show us uh, how everything works. Well, there's never a throne such as this one, I assure you. <laughs> Although we tankers love to talk about shooting and firepower and all that, the radios ultimately are the most, the first most important item. And the tank commander is in charge of the radios. He has uh, in the VRC-12 system uh, of the 1960s and, and through 80s, you have a, a receiver transmitter and two receivers. Therefore, you can transmit on one frequency and listen on two different ones, which for the Marine Corps, uh, with our uh, tendency to be supporting infantry a lot uh, was very important. Uh, there's also a power supply here. There's a switch here by which I can uh, select uh, listening to everything or listening to only one or two of these these particular uh, uh, receiver and transmitter items. Okay, then turning to the firepower end of things, right here, uh, right in front of the commander is the rangefinder eyepiece. Two eyepieces for each uh, side of the rangefinder. It's a simple coincidence device where you, you take the two images and bring them together by by twisting the control, which actually turns the mirror on the left one in order to triangulate with great accuracy the target. The right eyepiece also serves as the uh, engagement site in case the commander has to fight the tank. The gunner is not able to for some reason. For that reason, the commander has his own set of uh, controls for the for the turret, aiming, uh, traversing the turret and elevating and gun. Over to the further to the right are my gun switches, so I can select machine gun or the the tank cannon, the 120 millimeter gun. Also, the power on and off switch. The uh, on the extreme left, a little out of sight, really, is uh, the switch also for the Xeon searchlight, where you can select uh, off or white light or red light. So here we are in the forward end of the turret where the gunner and the two loaders would ordinarily be located. Of course we have the breach of the 120mm rifle taking up a lot of the space in here, but otherwise, you know, for other, compared to other tanks, this is actually kind of roomy. I mean, what do you make of this, Can You set up, a, set up a camp here, put up a hammock? Right now it could be, except that in action, this breach is going to come to the rear uh, 13 to 15 inches with great violence. Nothing will stop it. And so anyone in the way is going to be in, in big trouble. So the loader, the second loader where I am right now, can't be in this seat just lollygagging around. He's got to be standing off to the side there, pressed, pressing flesh against the turret wall. Likewise, the first loader has a little bit better position over there. Right, so the seat you're in right now was previously occupied by the gunner in the earlier versions of the M103? Even further back, the first gunner. That was back in those crazy days when they wanted the gunner to, as in the M4, 47 medium to do all the work, do the, the siding, the ranging, the setting of controls, the aiming and the, and the triggering. Um, 
So the, as in the M47, the gunner had to do the ranging, but in this case, the range finder is way back there. Therefore, the gunner moved just to the side and forward of the tank commander. So he operated the periscope, the CW, the range finder, as well as this periscopic sight and all these other controls all moved uh, over a meter and a half to the rear here, leaving ammunition up here. So why did they move them forward? It was considered unsatisfactory. It was uh, pretty much a labor overload. We have to remember the rangefinder back then is a stereoscopic rangefinder, more difficult to use than the uh, coincidence that we have now. But basically, uh, it was simply too much for uh, overload for the gunner, and it was considered unsatisfactory when it was produced as the M103 and the Marine Corps version M103A1 reversed this by moving the gunner back forward here. And of course by moving it forward it also means the linkages are much simpler for the optics as well. Well this is one reason why you had the two coaxes in the first version of the tank because there was no way for an articulated telescope to go all the way back to where the gunner was. So you, in order not to waste the space you put another coax machine gun. But uh, we, we in the Marine Corps wanted the second auxiliary gun sight as a backup to the periscope and we wanted a number of other features and, and everyone objected even Continental Army Command objected to the, the 103 and found it unsatisfactory. But the Army went ahead and accepted its 80 tanks in the 103 version. Of course, as a commander, the most annoying feature of this move for you was that you could no longer kick the gunner. Absolutely. It's the only time you've seen that the, the gunner, the crew, the rest of the crew is isolated from the commander more than any other tank I know of. Okay, well, let's look at all the various controls and gizmos. So starting at the top and projecting through the turret roof, we have Periscope M29. This consists of two components. You have a Unity sight, which is used for scanning and for firing the coaxial machine gun. And the primary sight is a Bi-8 telescope with a reticle in it, which is affected by the ballistic computer. Behind is the Cant Corrector M3. Now what this does is it allows the computer to take into account any tilt to one side of the tank, which would uh, basically result in a miss when you apply uh, super elevation. The Cant Corrector will compensate up to 15 degrees to one side or the other. So moving down to the ballistic computer, the range will receive an initial input from the commander's position, or there is an option for a manual index here. After the first couple of shots, if you're missing, you can do a manual range correction just a little bit uh, shorter or further by use of the range connection knob. Down to the bottom right is the ammunition select, controlled by this large handle. Currently it's AP, so to change it, you pull out, and as you go in and out a little bit, you can change the ammunition selected, so we now have HE. This then changes the super elevation applied through the ballistic computer and raises the gun tube to such an extent that it will still generate a hit. The two reticles for the 102 could be selected by use of this pull lever. If it's all the way forward, you have heat reticle selected. To change it, pull back out and it's high explosive. As we move further down, the gunner's control handle will traverse the turret a full rotation in 20 seconds, left to right, and elevate and depress the gun, elevation being 15 degrees and depression being 8. At the front, of course, he has his trigger. These two little knobs back here are potentiometers. They basically null out the drift. Otherwise, as soon as the gunner activates the hydraulic system, the turret will start to swing around on its own. Now in the event that the power system fails, there is always a manual backup. This is a manual pump handle for elevation with an auxiliary electrical firing tab. And to the right, we have a manual traverse handle. Now note the azimuth indicator, which is used for indirect fire as the traverse is engaged. By use of this azimuth indicator, the tank may be used in an indirect fire mode without being able to see the target. And it also uses the M13 quadrant, which is located to the left-hand side of the gunner.
So down by the gunner's feet there are two more controls of interest. By his left foot is a manual trigger. In the event that the electrical trigger does not work, he can manually release the firing pin uh, to strike the base of the primer. Down by his right foot, although it is actually a handle and not a foot pedal, is the turret travel lock. Uh, by engaging this, it prevents the turret from being traversed accidentally or even deliberately. To the right of the gunner is his main control box. On the furthest right, you have power traverse and higher elevation, or manual mode. Gun carry is a way of uh, make freeing up the guns lock into the hydraulic elevation and traverse. It just means that as the gun is bouncing around on the tank on rough country, it's not trying to break the system, it's not being held rigidly in place. Uh, the power triggers for the main gun and the coaxial are also to be found here. It says left on because it is a residue from when the tank had two coaxial machine guns. And finally, at the very end, is a little red light. When that little red light comes on, the gun is ready to fire. This is the fire control quadrant also used for indirect fire. Note the little spirit level down here. This is required to make sure that the sight is level before you attempt to input any super elevation to affect the range of where the round is going to impact. Of course, one of the unique features of the M103 was the two loaders required to service the two-part ammunition for the main gun. So, Ken, here I am in the loader seat. The gunner's in front of me. You're to my left. What are, happens next? We are crew. You are loader number one. You'll take the up to 51-pound projectile out of this uh, canister, uh, this container, and you'll place it here in the entrance of the breech and push push it in about halfway. I, as the second loader, then take this propellant charge and mate this rubber end or uh, plastic end to the back of the projectile and then I, the second loader, ram it all the way in in one evenly even strong movement. This is this, so the entire 51 pound projectile and 39 pound propellant is rammed home by one loader. That's why you could always tell the second loader in the M103 tank. He had a very over large right bicep. And it was crucial that the motion be unrelenting uh, one single stroke because if if it's uneven and the propel the charge, or sorry, the projectile gets ahead of the, pro the propellant charge, there's a, an air pocket which is never can be closed. No matter how hard you try ramming over and over again, that projectile is now all the way into the chamber engaged with the uh, uh, rifling, can't be pulled out by any, any force known to man. And you can sit here all day with the propellant charge and you'll never load the gun. The crew literally literally gets out with her, puts the rammer staff together and bangs the projectile out uh, so that you can resume firing. Very rare, but it does happen, so it's crucial that the loading be precise and very strong. Okay, so I start, I grab my projectile, and it seems to me in order to get the projectile in, unless I'm very good with my left hand, I mean, could you, have, you could have a left-handed loader, right? Uh, true. But most people will come all the way over That's to your right. side. We're going to get real friendly. I'll place it down, and then I place myself way back at this end. Now, I'm assuming that you don't have any room to grab your charge until after I've come back to here. Unless I've got a ready one here, and that's only to start with. So I can then step in here, complete the ramming, step back, and then the most important thing left is that I, the second loader, presses this uh, device over here, the uh, loader safety switch, which was only incorporated in the M103A1 and later. This it completes the electric firing circuit so that the gunner can fire, and that's where the gunner's ready light comes on that you pointed out in the previous sequence. Now that we have the breech closed, I can point out where the firing pin is located, and if we have to uh, recock the firing pin for a second attempt to fire, it's done with the cocking lever here. Now while I'm here, the hole here is a threaded hole for a large eye bolt that's used with a uh, with a winch to uh, extract the breech block, block and tackle rather, to extract the breech block for cleaning. And then over here on the left side, we have the, the uh, breech operating device handle.
Okay, as a surviving second loader, I'm going to show what his duties are on this side of the gun. Looking at the equilibrator, which keeps the, which counterbalances the huge uh, barrel on this gun, he checks this gauge and makes sure it's within operating uh, tolerance. Going to the recoil cylinder reservoir, he sees that there's enough uh, hydraulic fluid in the recoil system to continue safe firing. Looking forward, we see the 30 caliber machine gun, uh, which is fed down to the left, from the left, from uh, 2,200 rounds of ammunition stored in that chute, just like that. It's that loader's responsibility to keep this gun charged and working at all times. It's electrically fired through the solenoid from the gunner's uh, position. Uh, spare periscope for the gunner. Uh, over here, two different uh, intercom connections for the two loaders, although the number one loader seems to have a connector on the other side. Here's propellant uh, charges for the 120 gun. Over here is the turret blower motor to exhaust the fumes that are going to build up in here after we fired a few times. Uh, and the all important loader safety uh, that's pushed by the second loader indicating that the gun is in fact charged and that both loaders are clear. So welcome back to our tour of the M103 tank. Alright, so the controls for M103 are going to be pretty easy for anybody to figure out if you've ever driven a car. At least, the obvious controls. Directly in front of the steering wheel. Right and left. Alright, the pedals are in the normal position. The accelerator is on under the right foot and the brake is under the left foot. One of the more unusual controls is this handle here. This is a hand pump for the inflatable seal between the turret ring in the hull and the turret. What you do is if you're going into deep water fording operations, you would pump away on this, it would inflate the seal. Now, it is important to note that with the seal inflated, the turret cannot be traversed. Once you have completed your fording operation, you then release the valve, the pressure goes to zero, the seal is deflated, and you can continue normal operations. As you continue around, we have the main instrument cluster. You can select which fuel tank your fuel tank wishes to uh, register. As you move further to the left, we have fixed CO2 fire extinguishers. You saw the two handles on the outside. There is another handle inside the tank for the fire extinguishers as well. Directly underneath the driver is his escape hatch. To escape, he has to get off the seat. The seat will fold up to one side he then pulls the escape hatch lever behind, the hatch falls down, and the guy can get out. To the left we have the controls for the seat, and a manual fuel cutoff, which is used in case of emergency or if the electric engine fuel shutoff button fails to work. Lights are controlled from the central lighting panel here, just like any other of the similar type you have to unlock, and then you're able to change stop, service, or what have you that you may desire. He also controls one of the other more important functions of the tank, the personnel heater, which we turn on or off. And he has a bilge pump control right here. So the starting process, first place the transmission in park, press down on the brake. Then want to turn on the master power. Verify that your fuel pumps are on. Right, you then move back, you check your fuel gauge, left tank, right tank, and you then have to purge the fuel lines of any air that may be in the system. Do this by pumping until resistance is felt. Once you've done this, you're now ready to start the engine, which is done back at the control panel. There's a very large red starter button. You push in, press down on the accelerator, and your V12 diesel rolls to life. Right, the gear lever has neutral. This vehicle will neutral steer from the neutral position if I rotate the steering wheel the tank will turn on its own spot. You can go down to low range, high range, or reverse. Reverse speed is limited to five miles an hour. It is also used as a brake. If you're going down a very steep hill, you can put the tank into reverse and use the accelerator to control your speed. The catch is that when you do that, the steering becomes reversed because steering on the tank is done by application of power, not the brakes. So if I'm in reverse and going downhill, if I turn to the right, the tank itself will actually turn to the left. 
the tank can be tow started if required. What you do is you tow it in high range at about 18 miles an hour. You then just drop the transmission to low and the engine should come into life as long as the fuel pumps are on and mass power is on. In the event of a complete electrical failure, we have receptacles at the back for a slave start. So basically, these are very large jumper cables. And finally, we have the controls for the driver's hatch themselves. All right, so again, most of our viewers are probably going to have more chance of driving a Maserati than the RNA 103, but just in case one of them does find himself behind the controls, what tips or hints do you have for driving it? Well, I think it's easier to drive than a Maserati would be. Think of it, you have a power steering, power brakes, automatic transmission, and you can park wherever you want to. <laughs> it's really, it's to be regretted, we can't have these more often. But anyway, the uh, uh, we're never going to outdo the, the four wheelers in zero to 60, because we're never going to get to 60. We're going to get to 22 or 23 with the tailwind on this one. But uh, it is sure-footed, and it crosses any obstacles that would stop uh, nearly any other kind of, any other wheeled vehicle. So you can go where Maserati dares not to go. How's or you that can go you? over at Maserati. Yeah, also, quite so. Okay, so that concludes our tour of the M103A2 heavy tank. Mr. Esses, thank you very much for coming along and showing us how this works. I uh, appreciate it very much, Chime. Opportunity to go back in time. Thank you.